So I was given a phone call by my neurologist um, about three weeks ago that I was JC positive. For those, um, Professor G, that don't know, what is the JC virus? It doesn't mean Jesus Christ, first of all, okay? So um, it actually stands for John Cunningham. And back in, I think the paper came out in the 1940s, um, the first index case of a person dying of PML happened to be a patient called John Cunningham. And he died in a hospital in London. It's called Guy's Hospital. And when they looked at his brain, they found PML. They described PML and they found virus and they identified the virus as part of a class of um, viruses. And this virus, you know, it's a human virus. It spreads around the population. In Japan, for example, over 80% of the adult population have got the infection. In the oh. UK, it's about, depending what age you are, but by 35, it's about 60% have got the virus. And if you are negative, there's a, a one to two, it's about a one to 2% chance per year of acquiring the virus. And you pick it up from anywhere. You know, you pick it up from kissing somebody who's shedding it in their saliva, probably you may get uh, from urine. Uh, and tensors. why are those levels monitored? So I know that's a pretty standard practice across your neurology team to monitor those JC virus levels while you're on DMTs and immunosuppressants. So what happens is once you've got the infection, your titers, their level of antibody go up very high. And this, this people who understand this from the COVID-19 vaccines, when you have the mm -hmm. vaccine, initially your, your antibody levels go up very, very high and then they wane. So as you control the virus, your antibody levels will drop and then they reach, you know, more or less a steady state. And we know that the level of antibody det uh, determines your risk. So I think the reason why high antibody levels increase the risk is because it's a marker that the virus is replicating in your body, okay? So if the virus is not replicating in your body and you may have got rid of that virus, for example, um, your antibody levels will be there because you've got memory cells. So once, once you've seen a virus, your memory cells continue to make antibodies you know, for the rest of your life. Right. So you will have low levels, but that doesn't mean to say the virus is there and active. And I think, the, and so that's why we actually have this risk profiling based on the level of antibody. It's called an antibody index. So people right. should ask, they should ask what the antibody index is. People who've got a level below 0.6 um, are probably not infected with the virus and we treat those at low, low risk. Between 0.6 and 0.9, the risk goes up slightly. 0.9 to 1.5 a little higher, but above 1.5, the risk goes up. Uh, and so most neurologists either act at the 0.9 or the 1.5 level and would then tell people, we've got to do something to reduce your risk. And that's why they usually switch them from four weekly to six weekly dosing because we now right. know that six weekly dosing what we call extended or interval dosing um, the risk of uh, drops by about 85 percent it doesn't go away but it drops quite substantially and gives some people uh, breathing space in 2019 i had um, undergone genetic testing um, due to a kind of concerning my first mammogram actually, and they found, um, uh, concerning areas. So we did a biopsy and they said, you know what, you actually qualify because of your genetic history and your family tree, which is horrific for, um, cancer mutations and cancer diagnosis. Uh, you qualify for genetic testing. Do you want to do it? And of course I said, of course, you know, being proactive and staying in control of, you know, making those decisions is vital. Um, so I came back uh, positive for check two mutation, uh, which gave me an overall percentage of, I think it was like 65% chance um, for a risk of developing either breast cancer or colon cancer. Now, knowing what I know about most of these treatments for multiple sclerosis, there are cancer risks that come in with those as well. Um, so it was sort of kind of a moment of, okay, well, my genetic disposition is not, you know, coordinating correctly with the risk factors of these medications. So it was kind of like, well, what do I do now? Um, yeah, that's, that's what's happening. <laughs> so in terms of your cancer risk, that's got to be looked after independently of your MS, to be honest with you, because you've got cancer, uh, you're at risk of cancer mutations. You don't really want to have a therapy that will increase that risk by causing mutations. Right. So my options were getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Some of the risks are not really true risks. So the ones that cause cancer are the ones that uh, work by DNA mechanisms and mutate DNA. And those therapies we don't use much in MS anymore. So this would be drugs like cyclophosphamide, 
drugs like mitoxantrum, we don't use those anymore. The other way they cause risk is by suppressing your T cell immunity and your T cell immunity and potentially B cell immunity as well, but more T cell immunity because your immune system not only causes MS, but it also goes around your body looking for cancers and, and, and dealing with them. So drugs that suppress your T cell immunity uh, have a higher incidence of uh, cancers. But there, the type of cancers depend on the intensity of the immune suppression and the duration. And to be honest with you, our MS therapies are not very intense immunosuppressive therapies. Uh, and so they're not a big risk uh, for you, okay, in my personal opinion. The ones I would recommend against are the so-called S1P modulators. So this is the fingolimod, saponimod, ozanimod, and penicillamod group of drugs. And the reason I'm saying that they, with fingolimod, there's a signal on, on uh, skin cancer. And there's also a signal on lymphomas. Uh, and so why take a risk of, of a, a, a chronic immunosuppression like that? You're on nedalizumab still, is that correct? Yep. No, we actually, so because my JC level was so high at 3.14, um, I got pulled off of it. And we're actually going to be switching over to Ksemta. Yeah, so what I'm going to say to you there, when the original anti-CD20 trials came out with ocrelizumab, ocrevus, there was a suggestion in the older population in the in the primary progressive that there may have been a higher number of breast cancers. Uh, to be mm -hmm. honest with you, that hasn't panned out. We've now seen data going out into year six, seven, and eight, and it looks like the cancer signal is a, what do we call a false positive. The, mm -hmm. in, the, the number of cancers occurring in the long-term follow-up is in keeping with what you'd expect in the background. The breast cancer signal hasn't really been seen with rituximab, which has been around for a long, long time. Right. So I think the breast cancer signal from anti-CD20 therapies is probably, uh, if it is there, it's going to be very, very small. Okay, so um, so the fact that you're going on to ofotumumab, which is Kasimta, um, is probably a, the right option. Other therapies, um, alimtuzumab, Remtrada, and cladribine, maybe are also two high efficacy therapies. They probably also don't increase long-term cancer uh, risk. I know it's in the label for cladribine, I personally think that uh, the data now would support cladribine not increasing cancer risk. Um, it's, it was just because in the trial there was zero cases in the placebo arm. And it, um, that made it look like there was a cancer signal. And as we followed these patients right. up, we saw that the cancer signal has disappeared. And in the way the drug works, unlikely to cause cancers. I say unlikely because you can never be 100% sure because what the thing about some cancers, they take 10 or more years to emerge. But at least in the short to intermediate term, so I'm talking about the two to seven, eight year period, uh, we haven't seen it. Um, the good thing about those drugs is that although they suppress the immune system, it's short lived. So it depletes the cells and your immune system suppressed for a short period of time and the immune system comes back. And when the immune system comes back, it's competent. So another option for you could have been one of those two drugs. Um, sure. you've got to be, you've, um, just to say to you in the United States, uh, for whatever reason, culturally, um, I found that clinicians don't like using immune, immune we call them immune reconstitution therapies. They just, the, the uptake is lower than in Europe, for example. It's just a I cultural see. thing. They, pref they prefer to give continuous therapies. I yeah. think the, the bigger question that I know myself, and I would imagine that other people having MS have, is when you have that you know, negative, negative, negative result, and then all of a sudden you're given a level like mine at 3.14, I, I was asking myself, okay, did anything that I do cause this? No, nothing you did caused it. You picked that up from the environment, okay? So it's a virus that's spread via social contact, you know, so you would have picked it up from interactions with people, possibly young children shedding it. We don't know. We, we don't know enough about the natural sh shedding patterns of this virus, but we assume because it's found in the urine, and it's found in saliva, it's spread via those two routes, okay? So you you picked it up from somebody in you, maybe even your partner, you know, your partner, because the thing about the virus is it doesn't always uh, shed continuously. The sh shedding is intermittent. All right. Is there anything that we can do to reduce the likelihood of becoming JC positive? No, unless just, you know, social isolation is what happened with COVID will happen with JC virus, but I think it's unrealistic to, and I, I wouldn't recommend that. I mean, I think one of the lessons we've learned from COVID-19 is that social isolation and too much of it is really, really bad for the human brain. Uh, yes. You know, all of the anxiety and depression and 
problems that are mental health problems are real Absolutely. and that, and they, and they because we as humans need to see each other and interact with each other that's how we evolved as a species right. and social isolation is unnatural and we know from ms and outside ms people that are lonely or socially isolated who don't have much social capital don't have much interactions do much worse Absolutely. I understand that very well. After the pandemic, it was a it was yeah. a it was a shocker. Well, I don't see any reason why we can't develop a JC virus vaccine. I cannot thank you enough, Professor G, for having this discussion uh, with us. And again, if you are someone that wants to learn more about multiple sclerosis, please hit that subscribe button and you will be in the right place.